This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a drama, sci-fi, thriller film called Domain. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. A news report reveals that a deadly strain of influenza has already killed more than 5,000 people in Egypt. After some time, the virus, now called the Saharan flu, has spread to France, Spain, Germany, and Italy. The disease soon reaches the US after the doctors fail to contain it. More time passes, and reporters reveal that the virus has killed more than a million people in the Middle East. As riots break out across the US, the World Health Organization begins the construction of half a million underground bunkers to ensure the survival of humanity. While the scientists try to find a cure, a lottery is held to pick who can go in the bunkers. Only one person is allowed in each bunker but they can communicate through chat rooms called the Domain. In one of these domains, the seven participants refer to each other by the city where their bunker is located. After being in the bunker for half a decade, Orlando confesses that he committed murder. He contends that he shocked the other survivors with honesty because he's getting bored of staring at their faces. However, Chicago argues that Orlando just likes the sound of his own voice and doesn't actually value honesty. As the other survivors berate him, Orlando discloses that he killed around 20 people. Atlanta tells him that she wants to pray for his soul, but she remarks that he might not have one. In response, Orlando taunts her by pointing out that Atlanta left her three children to fend off for themselves in the surface. Houston stops him and stresses that he's going too far, but Orlando contends that he's only telling the truth. Boston proposes to ban Orlando from the domain because he's been causing trouble since the first day. Orlando asserts that they don't have the means to kick him out, but Denver reveals that he can do it. Denver warns the group that banning Orlando would be permanent, and he would be isolated for the rest of the quarantine, which could still take more than 20 years. Boston, Chicago, and Atlanta vote to kick Orlando out, but Phoenix thinks banning him is extreme. Denver agrees with Phoenix, so he votes against Boston's proposal. They seem to end up in a deadlock as Houston refuses to vote, but Orlando dares Denver to ban him anyway. Denver hesitates, but Orlando keeps taunting the group, so he eventually decides to remove Orlando's feed from the domain. That night, Denver contacts Phoenix to check on her. Phoenix asks him if he understands her reasons for voting against Boston's proposal, so Denver explains that he agreed with her, but he also empathizes with the other participants. Denver allays her fears about Orlando's predicament by reminding her that he's still alive in his bunker. Denver then wishes he could be in the same room with Phoenix and touch her. Phoenix feels the same and stresses that it's the only thing that gives her hope for the future. Denver and Phoenix end the chat session by putting their hands on the screen and expressing their love for each other. After 8 months, Phoenix and the survivors continue their daily routines without Orlando. After a bath, Phoenix consumes a food shake called Suplevel and uses the exercise machine for a few minutes. Soon, the survivors appear on screen to greet each other. Houston complains that his sleep cycle is ruined because of the lights in his bunker are malfunctioning. Atlanta asks them to join her in prayer, but only Phoenix is interested. Atlanta sends her a text file and discloses that it's a prayer that she used to recite to put her daughters to bed. They soon begin praying, asking God to make them brave enough to face the darkness they encounter in their daily life. They end it by appealing to God to help them retain their sight to remind them that light will emerge from the dark. After the prayer, Boston asks the group to relay the reports about what's happening outside. Denver discloses that the network indicates that 3 billion flu particles have been neutralized overnight, but he notes that it will still take 19 years to eliminate the disease. Phoenix reports that the bunker population has been reduced by 8 people since the previous day. Chicago gets exasperated because they're just looking at the same numbers on the screen, but Boston argues that each of them needs to pour their attention on one statistic to keep them focused. Chicago gets impatient and pushes a button on the keyboard to activate the orientation video that they've already seen multiple times. In the video, Nadine introduces herself as the designer of the bunker and tells them that it will keep them alive for up to 70 years. She reveals that the bunker is 30 feet underground, but the artificial day cycle keeps their sleep patterns normal. Nadine discloses that they created Domain to keep the survivors from feeling isolated. She notes that each Domain has 7 participants because they learned that groups of 7 create an ideal long-term social networking community. That night, Phoenix and Denver lie on their bed while staring at each other through the screen on the wall. As they contemplate their future, an alarm suddenly starts beeping to indicate that the backup power is below 50%. So Atlanta uses the exercise machine to charge it. After a while, each participant notices that their terminals are malfunctioning. They get more worried when the terminal is totally shut down because it was supposed to be on all the time. As the group debates what happened to the system, Phoenix suggests turning Orlando's feed on because she thinks banning him might have caused the glitch. 
However, Denver reminds her that the ban is permanent. Denver vows to try, but Phoenix gets upset when she detects his lack of interest in her suggestion. Denver initiates a private chat with her to convince her that he wants to help. Phoenix confesses that she's upset because she's also thinking of her mom, who died before she got into the bunker. Phoenix reveals that she won the lottery while serving a prison sentence for what she did to her mom. She recounts that she ran away from home when she was 17 and became an addict. While she was high one night, she accused her mother of stealing her stash and stabbed her with a knife, but she eventually found the stash in her room. Later, Denver contacts Phoenix in the middle of the night to tell her that he managed to find out how to lift Orlando's ban. Denver soon turns on the feed and searches the screen for Orlando, but he's not in the room. When they tell the others, Buston scolds them for making decisions without informing them. Denver suggests making some changes and argues that Boston shouldn't be in charge anymore. Agitated due to lack of sleep, Houston agrees with him because Boston can't fix the artificial day cycle in his room. Houston thinks that Orlando is getting even with him for voting him out, but the group points out that he abstained from voting. Phoenix surmises that Orlando might have escaped so she goes to her door to see if it would happen. But the group stops her because she might get exposed to the virus. After some time, Boston contacts Phoenix to express his dismay that they unbanned Orlando without consulting him. Boston then warns her about Denver and discloses that he makes him feel uneasy. He notes that Denver reminds him of his dad who is friendly and charming on the surface, but very mean behind closed doors. Phoenix dismisses his concern and contends that Denver is nothing like Boston's father. Later, Phoenix plays a recording of a previous video chat with Denver. The video features Denver touching himself while Phoenix encourages him. The video gives Phoenix an idea, so she contacts Denver and asks him if he can find out if Orlando made his own recordings while he was banned. Not long, Denver finds several video files of Orlando working out. Orlando doesn't seem bothered that he was cut off from the domain. In the last recording, they see Orlando doing push-ups, but the footage is suddenly corrupted by static. However, they can still hear Orlando's voice telling someone to leave him alone. When the video returns, Phoenix notices that his door is open. They soon skip to the very end of the video and see the door closing on its own. When they tell the group about the recordings, Houston starts to suspect that the flu is not real, and Orlando put them in the bunkers to make them go crazy. Phoenix fears that something worse is happening, so she advises the group to find a way out of their rooms. Boston suggests putting it to a vote, but Atlanta notes that they can't make a proper decision because Houston is out of his mind due to the lack of sleep. Later that night, Phoenix inspects the walls to see if there are any openings. Suddenly, Denver appears on the screen and calls her attention. The two chat for a while, but they're interrupted when they hear strange noises. Soon, the rest of the group hears the noise and approaches the screen. They're all horrified when they discover that the noise is caused by Houston banging his head on the wall. After a while, Houston smears blood on the glass to spell the word sleep. As he screams hysterically, the group sees a man entering his bunker before the video feed malfunctions. By the time the feed returns, Houston is already gone. Phoenix wakes up and learns that a rat has entered her room. Phoenix notes that the rat must have entered the bunker through a panel she tried to pry open the previous day. When Phoenix reads the label behind the panel, she discovers that it's a part of an emergency vent. The others are perplexed when they see similar panels in their rooms because they expect to find dirt behind the walls instead of vents. Phoenix decides to take charge when the group starts arguing about what they should do next. She asks Denver to contact other bunkers and instructs the rest of the group to find a way out. Chicago, however, refuses to help. Atlanta decides to break the pipe that feeds Supplevel into her room. When she looks through the hole, she's perplexed because there's nothing but empty space. As she continues to inspect the hole, the door suddenly opens, so she clutches the picture of her daughters and starts praying. Like what happened with Houston, the video feed is corrupted, and Atlanta is gone by the time it returns. The pessimistic Chicago gets even more discouraged by Atlanta's disappearance. He picks up a blanket from the floor, revealing that he's been hiding sublevel to keep others from learning that he's not eating. He then proceeds to tie the blanket to a pipe on the ceiling. Phoenix and the others plead him to stop, but Chicago says goodbye to them and hangs himself. Phoenix and Boston take a moment to grieve for Chicago, but Denver interrupts them to disclose that he has managed to find other feeds in the network. The first room they see is empty, so they assume that the occupant has been taken. They also find a feed showing a room where the artificial day cycle is glitching and another feed featuring a woman who slashed her own throat. Denver then informs them that there are only a thousand feeds, suggesting that the people in charge lied to them because there should have been half a million. Phoenix notes that they might get out by cutting a wire that connects the door to the computer. Denver instructs her to meet him at the city hall and Phoenix when they get out. Phoenix invites Boston to come too, but he points out that he's 3,000 miles away. They soon locate the wires in the bunk and disconnect them from the computer. After going through the door, Phoenix sees a ladder on the wall, only to find that there's no opening in the ceiling. However, she discovers that the wall is another door that leads outside. Soon after Phoenix gets out, she finds herself inside a building and sees Denver coming out of his room. They touch each other and kiss. 
wondering if they're really seeing each other face to face. Moments later, Boston comes out of his room and sees the couple embracing. Boston approaches them and asks how they ended up in rooms next to each other. Phoenix surmises that they must have been there the whole time. The trio starts exploring and finds their way to the rooftop. Their eyes are overwhelmed by the sunlight for a moment, but they eventually recover and find out that life seems to be carrying on outside as if there was no pandemic. After a moment, Boston and Denver tell Phoenix to hide because there are two guards at the exit. Boston decides to distract the guards because they're blocking the only way out. After Boston shows himself, the two guards chase after him, allowing Phoenix and Denver to run to the door. When the pair gets back down, they continue exploring until they find an office that has pictures of all members of their domain. The couple tries to leave, but Nadine arrives and recognizes them. Nadine immediately pulls out a gun and points it at Denver. Phoenix gets in front of him and pleads with Nadine to put the gun down. But Nadine tells her to get out of the way and claims that Denver is extremely dangerous. Nadine then explains that Phoenix is still in prison and she's an unwitting participant in an experiment. She reveals that the epidemic was fabricated and they slip sedatives in their food to fly them out to the facility in California. Nadine contends they're shutting down the domain soon because their videos leaked and the public learned that they banned Orlando. She stresses that the public is also angry because they think the prisoners are not getting enough punishment in their environment. When Phoenix inquires why she was picked, Nadine notes that Phoenix was unlikely to reveal her history to others and the most likely to believe the flu scenario. Phoenix then asks what the others did, so Nadine explains that Orlando was a career criminal who was in and out of prison. Houston was convicted for being part of a gang and involved in at least 20 murders, while Atlanta was incarcerated for drowning her three daughters before attempting to kill herself. Chicago was a prostitute who killed his clients to rob them of the cash and jewelry. Boston robbed a bank with his two brothers, but he killed them both while they were dividing their loot. Lastly, Nadine reveals that Denver stalked and killed 11 women he met on dating websites. Phoenix breaks down upon learning about Denver's crimes. Nadine argues that she gave them hope and purpose by allowing them to live in a humane atmosphere, but Phoenix argues that the bunker is worse. Soon, two guards arrive to incarcerate them. Denver tries to resist, but they knock them both out with tasers. When they regain consciousness, Phoenix and Denver find themselves tied to a chair in front of each other. Phoenix expresses regret that she believed that Denver loved her. Denver contends that he loved her in his own way and claims that he also loved the women he killed. He notes that he started suspecting that they were still in prison when Phoenix told him she killed her mother. He thought that having three convicted felons within their group was too coincidental. When Phoenix asks why he didn't say anything, he explains that he was having fun watching it all play out. Phoenix surmises that she's just one of his victims, but Denver insists that she's unique because she's the one he can never have. Not long, guards arrive to take them back to their bunkers. In the hallway, they find Atlanta, Houston, Boston, and Orlando waiting to get inside the rooms. Orlando mocks them for being hypocrites and taunts Atlanta by asking what she did to get incarcerated. Before the guards can take them inside, Orlando knocks a guard out and grabs his gun. He approaches another guard while aiming the firearm so the guard shoots him dead. As they enter the room, Denver tells Phoenix not to worry because he'll be next door. The group soon enters the bunker, which now seems deprived of the conveniences they once enjoyed. As Phoenix lies on her bed, she recites the prayer that she learned from Atlanta, asking God to help her retain her sight so she can see the light that comes out of the dark. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like, it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.